Hello everyone, this is Venom Geek Media here, and today we're basically rounding out our Romulan Doctrine series. I mean, I'm not going to say that I won't do the 22nd century, but as you will see from the title of this video, we will be looking at Romulan Doctrine in the Lost Era, and thus we will have a complete timeline of the evolution of Romulan Doctrine all the way back from TOS all the way up to the Dominion War, you know, basically informed by what we saw in the Kitima Massacre and the ships that we see and the difference in how the Romulan Empire acts compared to how it did back in, say, the Tomed incident. We'll see some of those doctrinal developments and the evolution towards what we then see in the Dominion War. So let's get into it. So the reason I didn't do this in the Kitmer episode is because it didn't really fit. There wasn't going to be the space or time to properly adequately describe this doctrine. What we really see in the Kitmer episode is a small part of this doctrine, which is very different in scope to previous doctrines. I would say in previous episodes you could kind of look at what happened in those events and see the doctrine in action. Uh, I would say with the Kitama Massacre you only actually see like a small part of the whole process, um, the whole doctrine in operation. So and so the reason I want to explain it here sort of separately is because it will then give some context to certain events and it will also help explain the design changes that we see in Romulan ships of this era, going from, again, that Termid incident, basically late 23rd, early 24th century designs to the modern style of warbirds that we see in the 24th century. The first thing to talk about is going to be the end of strategic deterrence. What happened to that doctrine? Well, what happened to that doctrine was the Termid incident, and it was made pretty clear that such a doctrine was extremely high risk, it was extremely provocative, and also, in terms of the enemy's perspective, it was also quite a predictable doctrine to deal with. And on one level, when you were kind of operating on a kind of basis of mutual annihilation, you sort of want to be predictable, that helps, you know, eliminate some confusion, but if you're not operating on that level, then actually being predictable is quite a hindrance um, to your to your security and to your doctrine and to your aims. And, you know, because the Romulans were changing stance away from the very high risk and highly provocative, you know, mutually assured destruction or mutually assured devastation, they also had to move away from being predictable and regular. Fundamentally, Strategic deterrence was a defensive doctrine designed to protect against a peer or near-peer adversary that possibly actually has a conventional superiority uh, over you and you need to counter that in some way. So it doesn't really facilitate power projection. It doesn't really facilitate expansion into, you know, other territory. The other thing is that this kind of doctrine and approach didn't really have much application towards the unstable Klingon Empire. Klingon Empire being unstable is a big opportunity for the Romulans, but they need to exploit it and so they need a good doctrine behind them that will play to their strengths and that will enable them to exploit that to the greatest extent that they possibly can. And so they required really a more flexible and more restrained doctrine, one that didn't put them at the risk of causing a devastating interstellar war at every turn. So they would no longer rely on the threat of massive retaliation, and they will instead move to presenting a threat of omnipresence. So that's the change in stance. No longer are you threatening massive retaliation, you are threatening the enemy on the basis of your omnipresence. And that is in the new doctrine known as Strategic Raiding, which actually, funnily enough, is named after a real-world doctrine. You can look it up. It's very interesting. So the TLDR for Strategic Raiding is control of planets is not important. Control of deep space is. Now, you've heard this before in Strategic Maneuver, but Strategic Raiding plays out on a much more strategic level, whereas Strategic Maneuver actually operated on a tactical level. So effectively, the idea of strategic raiding is that by engaging in deep space interdiction and planetary raiding, one increases their 
presence in enemy space. Now, that's not necessarily you occupying enemy space. It, presence more refers to making yourself more imminent and and present in the mind of the target. You know, aren't necessarily there, but you're saying you're there through interdiction and through raiding. You are giving the impression of presence. And again, it ties back to having that advanced cloaking capabilities that they can't ever really verify for sure whether you are or aren't actually there. Plays into that idea of presence. The whole goal of this approach is that it can be implemented with a small number of vessels. You don't need a large number of ships to carry this out partially because you've got your cloaking device, you can hide, you can conceal the true strength of your forces and thereby you can give the illusion of being much larger than you actually are and again create that sense of presence where actually it doesn't exist. A key characteristic of strategic raiding is that it is a it operates on a level of persistent low level attacks. This is not warfare. There are no strategic objectives other than the domination of deep space and the besieging of the, the enemy's morale, the enemy's willpower, uh, their ability to move about their own territory in confidence. That is what you are doing. You are not seeking to actually control a planet. Possibly that comes at the end of this, but this again, you play it out on such a low level over such a long time frame. It's never enough to justify going to war because what you're doing is so minuscule. It's not sufficient provocation. Okay, maybe it's considered as skirmishing, but it's not enough to warrant an all-out war, at least not without making the enemy appear like the aggressor by escalating. You're just doing low-level, you know, a little bit of raiding, a little bit of pushing here and there. You know, and then if they escalate to war, well, you can say, well, whoa, whoa you just escalated to war. Right, well, we better bring out the big guns now. The idea is that the enemy would never get to that point because you would become so present in their minds that they would think, well, there's no point going to war with them because they're just, they're, they're among us, they're everywhere. Add that, that there's also an intelligence operation going on at the same time to subvert their government or claiming to subvert their government. And then you get a whole combination of just paralysis in the enemy. He can't move and he can't sort of secure the political conviction and will to react to what you're doing. So it basically takes place at three levels of operation. We have interceptions and border raiding. This speaks to itself. Any ship is really capable of doing this. It does what it says on the tin. Basically, you see a ship passing by their side of the border. You know, it's just, just their side of the border. You might poke across, hit it. You see a vulnerable colony on the border, hit it, you know, and just, you know, and it doesn't have to be huge. It doesn't have to be a colossal attack or a big assault. It just has to be little and often, and that will be how you operate at the border. So that's actually the area of the greatest frequency. That's where the most attacks will happen. And basically, the deeper we go into operational depth, the more grandiose the attacks will be in order to inflict the greatest amount of psychological impact. So the next level of operation is deep interdictions and strikes. This is obvious what this is. If you consider enemy space as like a tree or a web, and you basically have your horizontal lines of communication between worlds. So if you say you look at the enemy border and they've got a chain of planets along the border, that's a horizontal line of communication. So the border interceptions and raids disrupt those horizontal lines of communication. And then when we come to deep interdiction and strikes, you're going now to disrupt the vertical lines of communications, the ones that basically deeper into enemy territory uh, and, you know, disrupting their movement outward effectively and their ability to then even get to the border region. You know, you're increasingly degrading that capability of of your opponent to protect and support their border areas. And then finally, it's got the objective of enforcing a defensive mindset. The enemy is not going to worry about attacking because he's already insecure in his own home. 
He can't even defend his own his own territory, let alone threaten yours. So that, you know, even if he could attack your territory and do a lot of damage, psychologically, they just don't want to because they feel so vulnerable in their own home. So this is largely achieved by the use of the cloaking device in tandem with quantum singularity, and that is what allows the Romulans to achieve deep space dominance. The idea of this approach is to force the defender to slowly concede more and more territory to you. At first, on a informal basis, so basically they just stop supporting and supplying certain colonies and thus are forced to make de facto territorial concessions and maybe those annexations get recognised further down the line, but it's whatever, you've got it now. Uh, the second is to then, as I say, break the horizontal lines of movement and also degrade the vertical lines of communication. And the key is to maintain this at a low enough level that it stays short of all-out war. This is skirmish, and it is just a persistent border skirmish. But it is one where you are slowly, slowly, slowly creeping forward. Actual war is to be avoided at all costs in this doctrine. We don't want a full-on war. We want to keep it at this level, and just let, and time will be on our side, effectively. We can just slowly, slowly creep forward, creep forward, creep forward, de facto into enemy territory, annexing as we go. So now I'm going to go into how they would actually implement this doctrine, and basically the different ships that will play a role in this doctrine. Um, so the first ships to really cover are what I will call pre-warbirds. Think about it like pre-dreadnoughts. These are basically the ships from the Tomed incident and earlier. They form the bulk of the Romulan fleet and carry out most of the shallow operations. So any of those operations on the actual border, again, particularly where frequency of attacks is the most key element, having numbers there is really where it counts. That's where you'll deploy your pre-warbirds because you've got a good number of those kind of ships, you know, uh, Firehawks, Winged Defenders, Novas, and you just persistently eat away at the enemy's borders and those horizontal lines of communication. Then moving to the new ships, you have the Raven, which is basically there to conduct reconnaissance. It is basically a universal reconnaissance platform. It can also contribute in delivering presence, particularly in the, the early stages of this doctrine, where you just you just you let them catch a glimpse. You let them catch a little glimpse, like just barely. But you just give the enemy the sense, the oppressive sense, that they are being watched all the time. And then you sort of affirm that by making sure you keep an eye on movements that perhaps the enemy thinks are secret. And then suddenly they get hit. How did that happen? And again, that does a lot to discourage movement and mobility because the enemy is just constantly under the impression that they are watched. And because a lot of the time they are. So then we get to the Danios. The Danios, it's a newer vessel, a little bit better range. So it's very good for raiding in depth. The Danios is very good for, again, moving down those lines of communication, moving down those vertical lines, showing up hitting isolated targets, hitting uh, enemy shipping. That's a very, very popular one because it's quite fast and quite maneuverable. So it's very good at hitting enemy shipping. And as, as we should all come to appreciate now, uh, supply chains, yeah, don't take them for granted. And the ability to um, disrupt enemy supply chains, particularly if you can do it clandestinely, it's going to cause a lot of bother for your enemy and their population might want some answers that the government will struggle to give them. I mean, what are you going to say? Oh yeah, there's Romulan ships in our territory and we don't know where they are or when they'll attack. You can't say that, can you? And then finally, you have the Vamalak, which can conduct further interdiction and strikes at depth, and it can be basically besiege at depth as well. You get a group of Vamalaks together, you, and you can just isolate a star system, basically have a cloaked blockade, and basically make it impossible for the enemy to access it or, you know, move through that area. 
and possibly you just have a shifting blockade. So one week you're in one position blocking one star system. The enemy's like, oh, well, we can't get in. There's there's Romulan ships there. And then the next week you move on to somewhere else and they go, oh, it's, the idea is to keep the enemy on their toes and to, to remain unpredictable and to continually um, break up the enemy's typical response patterns by yourself not remaining static. In order for the enemy to effectively respond, you'd have to remain static. You'd have to stay in a place for a, for a long time so that they could respond. But if you keep moving, every time they basically have to reset that decision-making and reaction process back to the first stage. And it just becomes increasingly demoralizing and there's less and less they can do and less and less that they feel that they can do. I will also finish off by saying that intelligence and subversion political subversion of the enemy is also crucial to this doctrine it's not just that you want the enemy to be scared to travel about his own space you also want to make him suspicious of himself you want to make sure that the government is suspicious of itself and the government is suspicious of the people and the people are suspicious of the government and so you make sure to engage on political subversion on multiple levels a lot of people misunderstand political subversion in thinking oh well this country backs this candidate and this country backs this candidate and they're all foreign puppets it's like no Political subversion takes place at every level, up from the highest levels of, of elected representatives down to the lowest level of, of social communication and, and advocacy. All levels uh, political subversion can take place. And the goal is not necessarily to install a puppet. That's difficult. Who'd want to do that? Then you've got to like back up the puppet and everything, and it's all a bit obvious. It's far easier... To just get the enemy government and the enemy society to a point where it's at each other's throats. And also, again, that's partially why you want to stay short of a war footing. They're never at war. They can't unify as if they are at war. So they, they remain at war with each other. And then that just frees you up, again, to just even more. Their decision-making process, their ability to react to whatever you're doing is further degraded, further weakened. And that opens up further opportunities for you. So, in conclusion, strategic raiding allowed the Romulans to exert a persistent presence in Klingon territory and expand into other neighbours. We don't know who those neighbours were, but it's quite likely that this was how they uh, were able to take them over. Like all Romulan doctrine, it is based fundamentally on bluffing and deception. And it's worth saying that in the long term, the Klingons would wise up to this and begin repelling attacks, and that would lead the Romulans to, to evolve their doctrine to be fit for a new generation of warbirds and for the war that those warbirds would fight. See you all next time. Thank you all for watching. I will now thank my members, my Navarks, David Reeves, Jeffrey Ballard, and Tully DT. My Commanders, Miami Jules, Captain's Quarters, Chase Rector, PQSK, Philip Ty, Jeff Hallam, Bird Monster, Mark Philippe, Robert Sampson, Sean Farrell, Guillermo Martinez, Das Blus, Adam Bowman, and Nathaniel Mead. And I salute my Centurions, Pendleberry, BOS Domestic Disputes, Marcus Hall, Paul Lash, Julian Arnott, Freedom Trooper, Okokatum Quaesto. Squadra Course, and Gabe Logan, and I welcome all my new sub-lieutenants. Thank you guys for supporting the channel, and I will see you all in the next video.